Electricast. Welcome to Nature Back, the talk show where we are talking with investors and entrepreneurs about the green future. Welcome to Nature Back, Diana. Thank you for inviting me and having me. <laughs> uh, you're running Beamline. Yes. Tell us what is Beamline. So Beamline is accelerator and uh, fund. So what we do, we back clean tech teams in their very early stage of development to help them to grow and to find the perfect uh, scalable market. You're based in Tallinn, but uh, teams can be anywhere? Teams basically can be anywhere, but we try to be very focused only for Europe. Again, it's uh, it's just because of our how quickly we can uh, get to the teams and uh, how how precisely we can help them. Because we maybe not so well knowledge about that, you know, Latin America landscape. Mm. You said that you're working with clean tech. How do you guys define clean tech? This is yes, uh, super interesting. And I think that everyone, if you listen about it, what is clean tech, you think about clean technology. Yes, as we like to uh, shorten the words in a, in startup life. Mm. Um, but clean tech in European Commission has very very. Um, wonderful um, definition and I will even read it because I, I just found it res- recently and I'm really really cool, uh, happy about it. So clean tech is new technologies and related to it business models which can offer competitive returns for investors and customers while providing the solutions for the global challenges and, and this is exactly how we when we didn't know exactly how the clean tech um, will be evolving. It was how we felt about it, that we knew that clean tech is not only about energy, it's not about, um, I don't know, some kind of logistics or some kind of purifi- purification stations, but it is about all of aspects of our lives. When you think about how you uh, uh, use resources more efficiently, effectively, uh, you use uh, Clean techno, clean energy, clean technology, less uh, chemical compounds, and so on. So, and it means it can be wherever, from agriculture to food tech, from energy sector to logistics, transportation, to space tech, basically. Mm. So, basically, definition-wise, many people could probably think uh, green tech when they say clean tech, and vice versa. Yes, I, I think it's now it's now becomes uh, more and more complicated, but uh, that's why we stick and we believe in clean tech because it is not only wider, but it's from one side it's super wide. From other side, when you define the global challenge, wh- um, where the solution is addressed, then it's super clear. Mm. When when you see when you you can understand, for example, as we have now in the current much, I don't know, the batteries. And we really know that it means that um, we, we, we uh, by uh, prolonging the lifespan of the batteries, we use the less of critical materials. We don't waste them. Boom. Mm-hmm. This is super clear. We know that this is shortage of the uh, raw materials. We know the batteries, the production is not the cleanest one and so on. So it means that if we keep our resources and we, we keep our equipment and machinery as long as possible, then it's already very good. Mm. You said current batch. So you, as an accelerator, you work with a batch logic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, currently, what kind of teams or what, what's the kind of over, overarching theme of the batch you're having in the accelerator now? So just as a spoiler, yes, we have now, I would <coughs> say, one of the most exciting batch because it's very deep tech and more focused in, in tackling with the challenges in material science, which for me is like the, the most interesting. But just to come back about the Beamline, as I mentioned from the beginning that it's accelerated and uh, fund, it means that we invest into teams. It, it, it means that um, when we decide that we want to work with team, first of all, we beg them with cash and then they, they enter the program, which is like... Uh, from three up to six months for us, plus the alumni club that we keep keep stick together with the, with the teams. 
And uh, so this is a normal batch, what we have, so traditional mm. equity, money, so on. And this deep tech batch is super interesting because it's at our, our first batch when we use non-equity money and we provide uh, all kind like very, very high, wide variety of different services for the teams, starting from the product development up to the business development and invest uh, investments. Um, so this is this is uh, super <laughs> complex and um, and and but because of it's uh, done with the in cooperation with our Ministry of Climate, it means that we can help really these deep tech scientists, which are not I would not say not so attractive for the early stage accelerators as we are, but it is not it's even not fair, but it's it's. Uh, um, not right to take the equity in such an early stage of the deep text because the the span when they start to think about the equity or start to go to the market is so long that they really need uh, to take the non-equity money. But from the other hand, I truly believe that it is super cool that ministry has given this money to the private sector because if we leave deep tech startups or scientists with their own startups ideas in the university, in the lab, and we will give them money only there, then it means that they are, they will not be pushed to the community of the investors, of the mentors. They, they will not just meet same people, you know. Basically, they will never get out of the lab. Um, Unfortunately, most, I don't want to say like because I think also that the university are doing a perfect work and they really try, and the very cool communities build up already around mm. the universities where they have their own programs. But still, we all know that, um, as we say it uh, in Estonian, Kula Kasvatoplast, it's the same as like the community is growing up the startup. Oh, yeah. uh, so the startup, to understand what's going on, he or she uh, need not only communication with investors and corporates or the representatives of potential clients, but also just to communicate with the, the people who may be one step ahead yeah. or a couple of step ahead. Just just to just to be in the community because it's so important. Mm, absolutely. You mentioned earlier the alumni club. I think that's probably the crucial part of all accelerators. Yes, yes. This, because um, when you just uh, work with... Uh, um, with these uh, teams during the, the this intensive program, it's it's you know it's like um, when you after the winter you want to get you into shape and you go into some kind of retreat or camp, then you get so motivated because you have all your teachers and coaches and all these like minded people all around and and you really the you're so pumped with the motivation and, and the inspiration that you just run, and as soon as you come home. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is, <laughs> or, or the same uh, analogy that you know, it's the January when most people go to gym. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then yeah. February hits. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Especially in our climate, it's the same with the with the with the startups. Then when you are like carry it and you you know that you can call whatever time and you have all these workshops and you and you have meetups, then really when you stay alone in your lab. And you you get these challenges and uh, you get these problems, then it's really really nice if you if you have, and of course, also the um, the idea of accelerator is like again from from the from the definition, it's it's idea how to push you so to give you extra momentum, and to keep up, uh, you need time so we cannot. Uh, even expect that uh, everything will happen during three months. No, <laughs> it will happen after a year, after two years. And sometimes all the knowledge what you have um, absorbed during the acceleration program, uh, it will reveal and become the skills really afterwards. Mm. Let's do a quick uh, break to the advertisements. We will be back in a few seconds. Life is hard, but finding a really great podcast makes the days go by so much easier. Hi, my name is Blue Tulusma. I'm a writer, an emotional intelligence coach, and the host of Humanize with Blue Tulusma, 
a podcast where we believe that when you humanize everyone in the room, a great conversation is almost guaranteed. Join us every week here on Electricast as me and my guest co-hosts unpack big topics and interview even bigger personalities with a sense of humor and a dash of mischief. If you're looking for a new best friend in your head, we've got you covered. Electricast. Welcome back. The uh, personally, how mm. did you got into the clean tech sector? I think I was always into nature. I, I really loved it, and I I was um, in our school. It was a club for the hiking. So, and I have have had a book about um, how to like hiker survival guide or something like this, <laughs> like for the kids. So mm-hmm. I was I was continuously reading and trying to find the north and south and uh, develop some tracks and so on. So it it was always uh, inside. And then when I just, uh, after the, uh, yeah, be, already before the graduation, I saw that I will um, <laughs> go away from school and go start to save pandas and koalas. Um, yeah, I know that they're in different uh, <laughs> places, but <laughs> I, I knew that I need to save the turtle, tur- turtles, the pandas and koalas, and then I even thought I'd go to Africa to save people and to save animals there. Uh, but uh, I was lucky enough, I went to Tartu University to the uh, Open Doors Day, and they were talking about a new uh, department, what they have just opened, and it was about environmental science. And it was not only about the scientific part, but it was um, like environmental science plus a little bit of policy and a little bit of municipality and governmental procedures about how you um, how you really make something happen on the level of the state. And for me, it was really, really like sweet spot because I, I was so, I really loved all, so I learned physics and chemistry, but then we were even given like how this kind of stuff, when, you know, for me, very, as for a very emotional person, when I was reading, I don't know, about damages uh, we have, for example, in our Baltic Sea, about everything was, for example, all this unfortunate heritage from the first uh, world war and from the second one, how much of the chemical weapons we have d- dumped into the sea. So, I was so depressed and okay, what 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 we should do? Like how we can save them? So okay, pandas will survive, but how we here can survive? That's why I think for me it was very crucial that I got the knowledge about the policy making. That yes, we are the policies and regulations and different kind of um, management tools. You can really achieve something. And then I was really into project management. I. I was working uh, very lucky uh, to get very, very interesting work in the one municipality in Mayatakuze. And um, because we have had enough of money because of the oil shale, which again, like really triggered my emotions about our nature, but from other side, because of the money were available and uh, uh, our mayor was, uh, he was okay with risks. So... We have done several of very very unique projects for for environment in 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 the municipality. So we are we still are very unique um, holding this um, uh, low temperature based uh, heating system in the village called Kikla. You can find this information in in uh, if you Google. Uh, we use uh, abandoned mines as the source of the low temperature heat. And we use it uh, to heat the whole village and to prepare the hot water. So it was very interesting in cooperation with the university. So this R and D, I I know how it goes from not only from the university part, but also from the part of the of the municipality of the new the beneficiary. So and all all this uh, just ended up that uh, I don't know. I really think that Beamline in this case, as I also like learned with my life that okay emotions are emotions we can hug the trees i'm really sorry for all the hu- trees huggers but <laughs> but as soon as we have money we can funnel them and really do something for the trees and for the pandas and for everyone so that's why clean tech and money 
are really the key for us to survive. Uh, Mätäkuussa Kikla, that's in uh, Itävilma part of yes, Estonia. Yes, not northeast of Estonia. Northeast yeah. of Estonia, next to the border to Russia, mm-hmm. for all the audience out there <laughs> who is not very familiar with Estonian geography, uh, which is probably the case for many of us. Uh, the Kikla, you know, being Estonian, I've never heard about Kikla. Cool. So now you know there is a Kikla. <laughs> okay, but that project still running. They still get the yeah, yeah. data from, yes, the, yes. from the mines. Wow. Yes, this is this is the uh, magic from renewable energy sources that you as soon as the machinery works and you maintain it just gives you the the energy. Wow. So yeah, it's it's not like uh, the oil is over. Right. The uh, and the koalas are saved and the pandas. Yes. So I I think that someday I will I will reach there. I just checked it. It was a little bit expensive. Uh, to save pandas, <laughs> it's a rather expensive project. <laughs> but there are, yeah, a lot of people around the world working on the, on that probably, and there's not too many of them left. I think pandas are the part of the China's uh, heritage dip- uh, diplomacy. Yeah, yeah, because there there are no any pandas left in the wild nature. It's like it just if you think about it, it's absolutely fascinating. It's like how quickly we have managed to damage the earth. It's mm-hmm. like it's it's uh, everything what we are talking i really like the the book about uh, this breaking points that uh, we we achieve it so quickly it means that the, the, very often it's the same as you are building something i don't know team or your or your financial scheme and you know if there is no enough of stability or the proced- pr- procedures are not there then it breaks so quickly you just you can imagine yesterday it was working and today it's over it's just over like it can be like uh, clearly clearly <laughs> that uh, as an emotional person how do you manage with this kind of uh, stress looking at the climate change and the environmental challenges and pandas are dying and and thousands of other species probably too on a regular basis uh, this is um I think that uh, it's not uh, a secret for anyone, but if you go, if you do something with your passion, then you just... um, So for me, the biggest challenge is not to make any kind of substitutional activities, you know. Um, If you are really thinking about that, yes, somewhere something is uh, really bad, then not to put yourself into this kind of emotions and to try to, um, how you can say it, that's like um, smooth it or, or like to, I don't no, know, greenwashing. It, yeah, greenwashing it from in from some some aspect. Sense, it's yeah. like it is like negative, mm. but you know sometimes when I don't know, uh, let let's just play around a little bit another mm. uh, angle that I don't know. Kids are, I don't know, from refugees, don't have education, and you come in for the Christmas with the uh, uh, gingerbreads. This is super nice, super cute. But this is what I really want all of us to try to avoid because emotions can bring this greenwashing and let it be like green emotions. Mm-hmm. It means that we do something cute, but is it really necessary? Uh, yes. <laughs> Does it make sense? Exactly. Yeah. The, uh, but uh, t- taking the contrast, I mean, uh, with the climate change accelerating, we have hit the 1.5, uh, the governments on a big scale talking to each other, nothing happens. Yeah. And then you work with a uh, you know, dozen startups in this scheme. Can the startups actually do something about changing this uh, paradigm where it seems like, you know, they're against the, Massive wall of I don't know, policies or the slowness of those countries. Um, I think that that's that's why I'm here because I truly believe that uh, this is the only who can save mm. only startups. It's the same as you know all these um, in a good way crazy guys who don't believe that something is impossible. They have some passion, they have some ideas. Th- these are these scientists, you know, these crazy scientists, those ones who argue with obvious things, those ones who argue with corporates, who say, but we have done like this, 
those ones who argue with that our grids cannot uh, rely on renewables, those ones who say, yes, it cannot now, but later. This again, we come back to the situation that um, all the governments and all the corporates, uh, even if we will eliminate all of the ideas that there are some kind of uh, agreements, pre-agreements, da-da-da, political games, but even in the best scenario, it means that govern governance and corporates, they have the high level of this very healthy inertia because if they will start pushing the changes and shifts very quickly, society will never ever come, you know, then we end up with revolution. Um, but from other side, this is super good that we have this kind of, you know, in I hope integrated and inclusive community of uh, startups because they should be, you know, like um, like a liquid between this iner- in inertia and huge like bubbles, and they should like ping them, dun, 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 dun. and um, and it means that uh, they will push the whole system towards something. So this is this is like the the smoothing the way for this huge huge machine which called our society. Um, that's why I, and of course, what what does it mean for the for the startups? First of all, what government should do, and uh, what I I really truly believe at policy. Now we know that the the biggest value on this earth is talents. If we think about the humankind, is only talents and this. Uh, um, empathic, uh, em- empathic uh, relationship with humankind and with Earth. Um, is first of all, so it means that we need to really uh, invest into people, and this is also what startups do, and this is also what government can do by investing into education. Another is again policy making and working with govern uh, with corporates and government with high level of this uh, pan-European govern- government institutions, that how we make our regulations be more flexible or be more adoptable for the newcomers. Some kind of like sandboxes in regulations for them to, to really to be a little bit quicker in disruption and for the corporates to be more comfortable with accepting these new ideas. And of course, corporates. But again, corporates are also under pressure of corporates' laws and regulations and all of this. So it means again, if we will create some kind of um, uh, this uh, liquid, a little bit of liquid uh, areas in all of this, so uh, startups and new ideas can be uh, can infuse into this st- st- stagmatic. Uh, and the really established systems more quickly, then I think this is how we can really proceed. And that's why acceleration, acceleration is super critical because we are like a bridge and we can explain to the startups, okay, please guys, this is how government really sees it. And you know, if you meet benefit, then you will understand how they see it. It doesn't mean they don't want to work with you. It just means that they have some troubles why they cannot do it. And this kind of translation, I, I think this is what uh, we in our language call matchmaking. This is what we do. <laughs> uh, we will be back uh, after short messages from the sponsors. I hope there are many oil companies uh, in this ad break for you. Welcome back. Uh, starting to wrap up this discussion, uh, what's next up for Beamline? Next, I would like uh, to grow a little bit more of our fund so we could uh, also co-invest with our investors. So it means that we could really... So Alumni Club would be not only networking and some help and some talks, but also follow-up uh, investments. Because we know the teams and we by us as co-investors, we can lead these investors because for us due diligence is already done. So for other investors who are just looking into the new teams and especially in clean tech, if they haven't ever been to clean tech, this is again a little bit, you know, safe bet. So it means that by uh, follow-up investments, I hope we will decrease 
or take some, you know, um, risks management list for the other investors. So this is what I want to enhance and to develop further our mentorship and uh, the inve- investment uh, credibility for the teams. Mm. What's the link with the EIT, Inno mm-hmm. Energy? Inno Energy. Ah, uh, this is uh, yes, very good that you have asked because this I really I'm really happy about this cooperation. So EIT Inno Energy last year was the biggest clean tech investor in the whole Europe. They do their job, I would say, super good because they invest plus they, I mean, they co-invest with uh, several of different big corporates from the Europe into energy sector. Uh, and as we already learned, the energy sector is also the same as clean tech, very wide. Um, and um, you know, energy understood that they need so-called like prolongation of their hands, and they uh, offered us to become a hub for the Baltic states, so we could be the extension of the inner energy. It means extension from one side of inner energy, huge uh, network, which is more than 1,200 uh, companies from all over the Europe plus US. So we can uh, have this kind of very uh, <laughs> uh, on-place on connections here in the Baltics. And plus, uh, from our side, we help inner energy portfolio to grow in Baltic and in Nordics. Uh, and uh, from the kind of accelerator side, more batches, more teams coming in? From accelerator side, um, yes, I hope we will have uh, maybe one more or a couple more these equity-free batches for the deep tech teams so we could uh, really develop this new layer of deep tech companies in clean tech fo- uh, with clean tech focus. And also we continue with our traditional uh, batches. But the main is uh, that we can, from the beginning, we can connect the teams with big players from all over the Europe. So we can direct, we have direct call with uh, Schneider or whoever else, ABB and so on. So I think the quality is uh, what we hit the first, not the quantity. Good. Thank you for your time, Jana, and good luck. Thank you. Yes, luck is super needed. <laughs> Welcome to Ringside with Ray and Prince. My name is Ray Leonard Jr. Oh, that's no, that's just my dad. My name is Prince Daniels Jr. Daniels again with a big hole. Touchdown. On this show, we come to humanize athletes, entertainers, business executives. We're going to see what makes them tick. Tuesdays, 10 a.m. Pacific time on Spotify, Apple, Amazon, and wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you there. Peace and power. Electric ass. Hey there, I'm DC. I host the Rock Podcast, Back to the Arena, The Interviews. It's about a 30-minute podcast where I talk one-on-one with a band who has released new music. You can find us on all the best podcast sites like Spotify, Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, and more. If you're a rock band like me, subscribe today to Back to the Arena, The Interviews. Electric Ass. Electric acid.